Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When the disciples of John ask why the disciples of Jesus do not fast, they betray their disregard for the Lord's unique station as the Messiah and earthly representative of the Father. Jesus is their King who brings the law of the kingdom. As the bridegroom, he is the head of the feast and the reason for the gathering. He is also the only person able to do what the law requires. As such, the only reason to mourn in his presence is if you do not like what he has to say. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 273 of the Bible as Literature podcast. On these past few episodes on the Gospel of Matthew, Richard and I have continued to emphasize an important point that was present also in the Gospel of Mark, namely that it is the word that Jesus speaks that holds authority in both narratives. Jesus is the anointed one of God the Father who brings this word to the nations. It's important at this juncture in Matthew to stress the fact that he's anointed because it would be easy to fall in the trap. I might even call this the egalitarian trap, that since it's the word of the Father that is the great differentiator, anyone who speaks the word is the same as Jesus. My answer to that statement is yes, and definitely no at the same time. Because in the story of the gospel, in the hierarchy of the New Testament, Jesus is subordinate to the Father, but senior to everyone else. The way that the hierarchy functions is always with the Word as its reference point, and we've been stressing that over the last several episodes, that it's always the Word that's the reference point. So while anyone can be a citizen of the kingdom, Only Jesus was selected and anointed to be the ambassador to the kingdom. He was the only one who was entrusted with the word to bring that word to the nations, to all humanity, both Jew and Gentile. So if one learns it and speaks it, he can speak with the same word that Jesus spoke. However, the person who speaks is still not the chosen son of God to bring this word to everybody. That's the distinction. Jesus is always going to be, as you said, Father, subordinate to the Father, but higher than everyone else because of his adherence to the word and that relationship then that he has with the Father. I mean, look, when we think about these things in terms of our contemporary perspective, it makes no sense because we think anyone can be the king. That's not true. Jesus was anointed king. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus' status is special and unique in this sense, in the same way that Paul's status as an apostle is unique. It's important to stress because I don't want our listeners to fall into the trap of an egalitarian mindset with respect to a very Roman text a very ancient Near Eastern text. Jesus is, in this sense, the representative of his father and the patriarch of the household. And this distinction becomes important because it gets at the heart of the misunderstanding of the disciples of John in this morning's passage. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast? but your disciples do not fast. Here, the disciples of John 
are using what they've been doing as the reference point of trying to understand what Jesus' disciples are doing. And it's so easy to fall into this trap where they say, well, okay, we're fasting. How come your guys aren't fasting? But the question is, why are they fasting? I don't know why they're fasting. The other thing is, compared to the Sermon on the Mount on 5 through 7, why are we discussing fasting? I thought nobody was supposed to know you were fasting. I thought the reference point was only the acknowledgement of the Father, not the acknowledgement of other human beings. So the disciples of John are on shaky ground here because why are they fasting at all? Or at least why are they fasting in such a way that other human beings know that they're fasting? The question betrays either disregard for the status of Jesus or a misunderstanding of who they're dealing with. At this juncture in Matthew, who you're dealing with is a very serious question. And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So here we see that Jesus is giving a parable where he is obviously in the story of the bridegroom, he is obviously the character of the bridegroom. And he's saying, why are you mourning when the anointed one is here, when the one who was sent to bring this teaching to the nations is present? Why would you mourn at the presence of the scroll? In Jeremiah chapter 36, when the temple was destroyed according to the will of God, to mourn at the destruction of the temple was incorrect. Why would you mourn when the scroll is present in the temple manifesting the will of God? Why would you mourn at the Lord's will for your destruction? Why would you mourn when the one carrying the scroll is present? The only reason to mourn in that case is not because your city got destroyed. The only reason to mourn is because of the reason why the city was destroyed, which is your rebelliousness and your sin. So don't mourn about the city. Don't mourn about the destruction of the temple. Don't mourn about the invaders, because then you're just feeling sorry for yourself. Mourn about yourself. Mourn about how you fell short, because this is what the word is telling you. This is why you can't have a fast without the word, and this is why the word is more important than the fast. So in this verse, the children. The word in Greek is not attendants, but it is actually sons, e.e., the sons of the bride chamber. What is the job of the sons of the bride chamber? It's to make sure that they're doing their job, making sure that they're attending to the bridegroom. So if they're mourning or fasting, how can they do their job? They have one job as sons of the bride chamber. Take care of the bridegroom. Attend to the bridegroom. Listen to what the bridegroom tells him to do and go and do it. That's it. It's very simple. If you're an attendant to the bridegroom, then you listen to him and you hang on his every word so that you can go and get it done right away because there's a wedding coming up. You can't decide to do it next week. There's a wedding. You have to take care of your job now. By the way, disciples of John, I don't know if you were around, but in 5 through 7, we discussed fasting. You're supposed to fast in such a way that only your father sees it, and then that way you can move on and not get the glory of human beings. So here we are discussing this. Have you heard anything about what I've taught? Have you been paying attention to anything that I've commanded? Have you paid attention to the teaching that I brought from the father? Because... It sounds to me like you're still trying to do things your own way and then maybe supplement that with a word here and a word there from Jesus as opposed to sinking your entire will into enacting, performing, submitting to the word of the Father that Jesus brings. We have to be careful here not to underemphasize the importance of the station of the bridegroom. Because obedience and respect for protocol and station does not require understanding. And this is where it is important and critical to emphasize the function of Jesus as the head. If you would have recognized his importance, and this is the scandal of their question, how dare you ask the bridegroom a question? The only question would be to ask, what must be done, Master? 
These are disciples of John. They're not Pharisees. Very interesting problem. The protocol and hierarchy matter. And I want to stress it, Rich, because had they respected Jesus' station as Son of God, we wouldn't have been stuck in this quagmire. But then again, if they weren't stuck in this quagmire, we wouldn't have a Gospel of Matthew, would we? Exactly. No, I think one of the reasons why, Father, people are going to have a hard time understanding what you're saying about the hierarchy is because when people read this passage, they think that the job of the children of the bride chamber is not to mourn, but to have a good time, to have a nice meal, to celebrate. But that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about the wedding taking place in time to celebrate. No, this is talking about the children of the bride chamber, or as your translation translated, the attendants. It's not about, oh, you're not supposed to mourn because you're supposed to be partying and having a good time. No, you're not supposed to mourn because you have a job to do, because you're working. You're a slave. You have orders to fulfill. This is the difference. So I don't want the audience to think that Jesus is telling the disciples of John, hey, you're supposed to party, not be all down and gloomy with your mourning and your fasting. No, he's saying do the job first, mourn and fast secondly. Piety is for the rich. Piety is indeed for the rich. (laughs) Where have I heard that before? (laughs) But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. So until now, we've seen the folly of the disciples of John who don't understand the unique and special status and station of Jesus Christ. And because they don't understand who Jesus is, they are now in verse 16 in the admonition of the Lord, They are now exposed as people trying to apply something to the new situation that exists because of the presence of the anointed one of the Father. They're acting as though he's not there. So they're behaving in an old way when they're stuck with a new situation. They don't know when to fast or why to fast. They don't know how their behavior should change based on the fact that the Messiah is now here. And as such, according to the parable of Jesus in verse 16, they're mixing and matching garments that will eventually result in a worse kind of damage than the first time around in Jeremiah. Let's think of it this way in modern terms. If you have your computer and it's running Windows operating system, you can't just go and take files from an Apple and start running them on a Windows computer. It's not going to work because it's a different operating system. What the disciples of John think is that, okay, we're just going to take what Jesus teaches and we're just going to run it on my personal operating system that John taught me or that I believe John taught me. Maybe they corrupted it. I don't know. But what Jesus is saying is that, no, 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 no. I'm bringing a new operating system. You guys are running on the operating system of your ego and of yourself, and of your self-determination, I'm bringing an operating system of service and slavery to the word of the Father. So it's not enough for you to just take my teaching and stick it in and see it work on your old system. It's not going to work that way. You have to understand the word holistically in the entire context. And like you said, Father, this goes back to the passage in Jeremiah, because it's not enough to just say, oh, we're fasting. Well, why are we fasting? Oh, we're fasting because the temple got destroyed, or we're fasting because there are enemies at the gates. No, that's wrong, because you're formatting yourself according to the way that the world thinks. If you were formatted according to the way Scripture thinks, then you would be mourning because you sinned and you rebelled and you did not carry out the word that your God, supposedly your God, commanded you to do. The operating system that the disciples of John are running is not an Old Testament versus New Testament kind of thinking or something like this, where they have an old way of thinking and now Jesus is bringing a new way of thinking. This is not it at all. The disciples of John are running their own operating system that they came up with. Jesus says the whole hard drive has to be reformatted and we have to put the word in there 
And this word is not something that Jesus brought from nothing. This is the same word that was taught since Jeremiah's time. But even in Jeremiah's time, they had to be reformatted with this word because they're worried about the city and their own piety as opposed to whether they were actually subservient and doing the will of the Father. The problem with Jeremiah's audience is the same problem as the disciples of John in that they want to do their own thing and not listen to Scripture. They want to do their own thing and not listen to the will and the teaching of God the Father. They want to do their own will and not listen to the words that come out of Jesus or out of Jeremiah, because what Jeremiah was teaching is also the word of the Lord. Look, I go back to my favorite example of all time for scriptural studies, and that is the beautiful story of the cat in the hat. You have a situation at home where there's mischief and there's chaos. Of course, the return of the parent is always looming in the back of the mind because mom was away from the house and she's eventually going to come back. It's so scriptural the way it's laid out. And then you turn to the last page of the book and you see mom walking towards the door and entering the house. Once that happens, once the mom is present, there's a new situation in the same venue. That's how you have to understand it. Like the parent has come home. The one who is going to carry out the instruction of the Old Testament is now present and on the scene. The one who was anointed to carry this teaching to the nations because Israel failed is standing in our midst. It changes the situation. We could be sitting here doing the podcast, having a cup of coffee. But suddenly, if Paul McCartney were to walk in, the situation would not be the same situation. Because Paul McCartney is Paul McCartney. He has a station that we will never have. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. So if you don't recognize that the situation has changed because of the presence of the bridegroom, the damage is going to be worse than the first time around. The judgment of the Lord is going to wreak more destruction than simply the fall of the city and the temple in Jeremiah. The destruction could impact the nations. If you don't understand that the one who was anointed to bring the teaching to the nations is now present and that God, his father, is with him, if you don't recognize that, you run the risk of harming not only Jerusalem, but the nations. If you acknowledge and submit to the bridegroom and act according to his command, then both Jerusalem and the nations are preserved. It's a powerful metaphor, because when you don't recognize who the bridegroom is and what his mission is, you subvert his mission and you put everything in jeopardy. Because there's nothing to hold the word anymore. And if there's nothing to hold the word, then there's no way to continue to bring this word to the nations. I mean, what Jesus is saying is like, if you have a certain way of thinking and you're trying to supplement it with what Jesus is teaching— it's not going to function as a supplement. It's going to destroy everything, including itself. Like if the word comes in and you have an old way of thinking, it's going to destroy your old way of thinking and the word. And so something new and very corrupt is going to be there. You clean out the house and you have seven more demons move into the house. Like it's going to be worse. If you don't allow the word to prepare you and to completely reformat your way of thinking, then what Jesus is teaching in this moment, in chapter 9, it not only can't take hold, it's going to be lost because it's going to corrupt the entire system, and it just can't work together. So the only way to hear this word is to become brand new in one's thinking and allow that word to become one's way of thinking, not fit in with your current way of thinking. God's word through his emissary and anointed one, Jesus, must 
renew your entire way of thinking and must become the new operating system and the new foundation so that you can finally understand what God has been teaching all along since Genesis 1. As we continue to read the Gospel of Matthew, just please keep this in mind, that what makes the scripturalization of the Roman household special is that it preserves the unique status of the patrician, it preserves the status of children and of slaves, and in the case of Jesus, it presents someone who is above the patrician and someone who is above Caesar, but subservient to the Father in order to transform a system in which the Pharisees and the disciples of John give themselves importance into a new system in which all importance is ascribed to the teaching, and it's the teaching that gives value to each level of the hierarchy. So it does level the playing field, and that's why Jesus, in a way, became the slave of all in the crucifixion, because he was the slave of his father. But that doesn't mean that we are allowed to devalue the importance of his station. This is so unique and so special to the New Testament, and it's what I value about Byzantine liturgy, because in its Roman trappings, it preserves the DNA of the scriptural system. It's brilliant that you can have hierarchy so that you preserve order and obedience, and you preserve community and respect and honor and shame and so forth without giving power to the man. No system before Scripture and no system after Scripture has been able to deal with the problem of human might so effectively if we would only submit to it. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. Just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.